Welcome to the Afterlife Files, where we investigate near-death experiences, share death experiences, and how they affect you. Unlike podcasts that are just stories, we will give you a heads up on what to look for in our conversation. And then after the interview, stick around. We help you make sense of those accounts so you can incorporate the insights into your life. I think that once you've had your most profound questions answered, living in the physical life is filled with much more peace and joy. If you're fascinated by the afterlife, near death, or shared death experiences, and have ever said to yourself, I would love to encounter the same places as experiencers, but of course without the physical drama, this is why I've created both guided meditation albums and our extensive five and a half day near death experiential retreat. Please visit neardeathmeditations.com for all the details. I know you will find this a profound way to explore the non-physical universe and easily access expanded states of awareness. Our remarkable interview with today's guest, Gary Cacciolillo, highlights someone who's had a rare blacklight experience. There are two things that I want you to look for in this interview. First, several times during the interview, you'll notice Gary look into the middle distance. He's not seeing anything here in the physical world. You can tell that he's looking inward, seeing and re-experiencing his NDE in his mind and body. Another clue is his body language. It's still leaning forward. If you're at all sensitive, see if you can feel what he's feeling. I think it's on the recording. He's returning to his blacklight experience and it leaks out to all of us. Second, notice the words, images, and metaphors he uses to describe his blacklight experience. I gotta tell you, this is incredibly difficult for most experiencers to describe. Gary does a great job. Most only do it with the goldfish simulation, you know, the one where they just move their mouth and nothing comes out. Uh, 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 uh. It's really hard to find the words for the complexity of the experience. Here's our interview with Gary. And we are in for a treat today. We have with us Gary Cacciello, who is the author and host of the very popular Everything Imaginable podcast, which is in the top 100 of philosophy on Apple podcast. He is also a paranormal investigator, tarot reader for over 40 years, and UFO enthusiast. He is also very knowledgeable on ancient archaeology. This Afterlife Files interview has an interesting backstory. Gary very graciously invited me to be on his Everything Imaginable podcast some months ago. During our conversation, I was talking to him about how near-death experiencers usually encounter one of three types of light, white, black, or clear. And when we were talking about the black light, Gary let it slip, well, that's the kind I had. Whoa, <laughs> that got my attention because black light experiences aren't that common. And so I just had to have him on my show to talk about that experience. So Gary, Yes. Welcome, and thank, thank you. you for being here. Um, set us up. Tell us about your experience. So, um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like something I was expecting. <laughs> for sure, you know. <laughs> do we like, ever? Yeah. I didn't, like, wake up one day and said, today's the day I am going to have a near-death experience, and it's going to change my life forever. You know, these things tend to, I guess, I know, at least for me, it caught me off guard, you know. And... <laughs> And um, but but what what happened is pretty. It, it, it's um, what it was. I was at my job, and um, and all of a sudden everything started flashing really fast. Like a, it was like a strobe light type of flashing. I was sort of like in and out of consciousness, I think. And um, and I tried. I knew something was wrong, and I tried to make it to the back of the store where I was working. So. 
I wouldn't like collapse out in front of everybody, but I didn't quite make it. And about halfway to where I was trying to go, I, I, I collapsed and had a an extremely long epileptic seizure that lasted for over 30 minutes. Oh my, that is long. So, um, you know, and while I was, it, I, even though it was 30 minutes to me, the time thing was, was, was really strange because, you know, I, like it seemed like eternity and at the same time, it seemed like a split second. So you're like, you're experiencing time and timelessness at the same time. Very, very strange, really hard to explain. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think we try to, I try to, explain it to people that have not had that type of experience they just kind of look at me like i'm crawling like huh what do you mean uh, you know yeah it takes you know, forever and it's just like that yeah so 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 there you know then you try to explain to people after that like well maybe there is no such thing as time maybe once you lose your physical body or your ego or whatever it is that you're shedding during that near-death experience time stops existing and you go right out into a world of infinite probability um oh, i like that description yeah so it, it's really strange and then as i was out what i experienced was i was in complete blackness what you two described as the black light experience um and it was like being in the center of the galaxy. Like, like I was in the middle of a black hole and the entire galaxy was spinning around me and it was like colors. It was sound. And I was not afraid. There was nothing there to be afraid of. I was completely aware. I had awareness um, that I was still, that I still existed um, and it was really, it's really a tough one to describe because, you know, just like the timelessness part of it, I, I don't think there's quite human language to describe these type of experiences. Um, it was just fascinating that I was there. I was conscious. It was super peaceful. Um, and, uh, it felt like, I mean, it does feel like home. It feels like that's where, you know, my energy originated from. Um, I didn't encounter any beings or spirits or any type of communication that I remember. And um, the next thing I knew, uh, I heard somebody shouting my name saying, Gary, come back, Gary, come back. And by then I, I woke up. I, I was actually like, my first response was like, crap. I don't want to go back. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I, I did not want to come back, but I was like, if I don't, this person's going to be mad at me. So I, I woke, I opened my eyes and there I was in the ambulance and I was like, wow, you know, like what just happened? Um, and then there's like sort of a sidebar to the story too. And this is another unusual, I don't know if I even told you this part of it, mm -hmm. but, um, I was in a hospital for three days after that. I got out of the hospital. And a couple of days later after that, I received a book in the mail from Oxford University, not Amazon, nowhere else. It had, and um, it was a book called Time Paradoxes. And the receipt of the book was dated six months in the future. What? So, one of the things that I was thinking that may have happened, and this sounds, I know it sounds outrageous. People think I'm insane for saying it, that maybe during that experience, I somehow connected with a future self, a future probability, mm. and sent myself that book as a reminder about this whole weird time phenomenon. I even took a picture of it with the receipt with the date on it and I posted it on Facebook to just to have that evidence, you know, that, that, that really happened. Whether, you know, like a lot of people will say like, well, how can it, maybe those two events are not connected. 
which is possible. Maybe they're not connected. But then again, I don't necessarily believe in coincidences either. Interesting. So you described um, being in this in the black light. So it's a it's a totally black space. Um, was it empty or, or was it full? The space that I was in was empty, but the surrounding perimeter was like colors, like the stars of the universe just swirling around. And, and, it, was, and it was sound, but it wasn't necessarily music. It was um, maybe the sound of consciousness. Oh, that's interesting. So was there a... a beat to it, a melody, a timing, a wishing, kind of describe that sound. What does consciousness sound like? It was more like a droning type of sound with shifting pitch. That's interesting. So it was uh, immediately was, I, yeah. I, you know, I go to Aboriginal, you know, work where that, that droning becomes a, an important part of their induction process. Yeah, I mean, it would say maybe something like a, like a, a didgeridoo type of mm -hmm. sound happening or like a, a synthesizer that's, you know, slowly switching, you know, keys. Interesting. And um, so the, the space that you're in is it's black. You don't see anything in it in your immediate vicinity. Um right. But I, I noticed you didn't say anything about being lonely or. There was none of that. There was no loneliness. There was no pain. There was no, you know, as, as a human being, I, I don't know. I, I know for me, there's always this constant nagging feeling of emptiness and craving. Like I always want something to satisfy myself. Yeah. That did not exist there. There was no sense of craving. So when you say you went home, um, so that's what the piece was about. The, this wasn't a strange place. This was returning back to something you knew. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I don't believe it was unfamiliar to me because if it was unfamiliar to me, I would imagine I would have had thoughts of not recognizing it. Or mm -hmm. maybe some anxiety, but that didn't happen. Or even questioning. I didn't even question it. I was just like, oh, that's yeah. important. Yeah. This, I was just present. You're just present. It just is. Yeah. You described it as um, a realm of infinite possibility. Uh, why did you feel that way? Um, you know, that's not something that I really... <sighs> It's a description that I came up with later on, um, you know, because as, as a podcast, I interview a lot of people and get different perspectives. And one of my guests mentioned that term to me. And, I, and, and, and when he mentioned that term, I connected with that type of experience, you know, and it also connects me with the idea to kind of explain the whole thing about getting a book from six months in the future. You know, if the universe is really just mathematical and there's every possible mathematical combination that's already in existence at the same time, and we're just sort of stuck within this framework where we're perceiving time, and then when we leave that, there's nothing left but all these probabilities. And when you have all these probabilities to work with, maybe you can enter each different future or past self and do a little bit of manipulation. Well, I found in talking with people that have had NDEs that over the course of their lifetime, they unwrap it. It's like peeling an onion. You know, you understand mm -hmm. it at one level and then, oh, Somebody says a word or a phrase like infinite possibilities, and you go, oh, yes, that connects. It, it, other than that, have you had that sense over how long ago oh, was oh, this? This was about 
three years ago. Three. And yeah. And I would say all the time I have different perspectives on it. It, it had, even though you have this experience for 30 minutes or whatever it is, um, afterwards, it's a lifetime experience. Because, because, yeah, you spend the rest of my like I know I'm going to spend the rest of my life unpacking. It's part of how I started the podcast. You know, because yeah. afterwards, I wasn't exactly the same. You know, things seemed a little bit different. different my priorities changed. Um, money and things like that stopped being so important. You kind of realize, like, oh, well, I'm part of this infinite cosmic thing. And um, all these things that we focus on in life are really minuscule, senseless nonsense that we obsess over. And so, so you know, it's like the, after you get the big picture, your perspective changes, and it stays that way, at least for me. And how is that meant? for you in relationships with, with other people. Some people think I'm insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think other people are curious and, um, I do realize that for me, relationships with other people is the most meaningful experience that we can have in this life. There really is, like, if you think about it, there's no reason for oneness to become duality, but for all these different dualities to get to know each other. Get to know yeah. ourselves, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no other purpose for it but, but relationships. So, um, what other priorities shifted in your life besides uh, a sense that relationships are really important, that kind of the foundation of why we're here? I think the other thing that really changed, one of the reasons I started the podcast too, um, once you have this experience, you're no longer afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. so one of the focuses of my podcast quite often is the out-of-body experience, near-death experience, um, astral travel, all that type of, all those types of topics, consciousness, um, people communicating with extraterrestrials through consciousness, hypnosis, all these types of phenomena that exist outside of the human body but deal with our awareness, you know. And when we say the word awareness, a lot of people automatically associate it with the brain. But if you're dead and you still have awareness, obviously awareness is not just your brain. Your brain, I don't know, is a neural network at best. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess the answer would be I, I realized that People don't need to be afraid of dying, and people don't need to be afraid of living. There you go. I think that's the greatest gift that near-death experiencers give to all of us, is that get on living. Because <laughs> this, this is a fun place down here in, in, in duality world, and there's so much we can learn about ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. Let that fear go away. Absolutely. Speaking of which, who is the first person you told about the, your experience? Uh, I would say the first person I mentioned it to was my ex-wife. And uh, she kind of dismissed it. The first person that really took it seriously and helped me to understand it was Jim Willis. And Jim I, Willis I is to you? Um, he, he's, he's written quite a few books on out-of-body experiences. Um, he's part of the Monroe Institute. Um, he was a pastor for like 30 years and then left that to pursue his interest in metaphysics and shamanism and out-of-body experience. And he was also an epileptic like me, and he had the same exact experience that I have it had the same effects on him um, and that's really when I was like 
you know, it's not just me. This this thing is is real. And after that, I started interviewing other people like PMH At- Atwater and and there's a hoot. <laughs> yeah. And I've interviewed, I've done probably at least 20, 30 episodes of on just near-death experiences, learning about them. Uh, we have something in common. PMH Atwater was my my mentor when I was doing my doctoral work on near-death experiences. <laughs> and uh, she's the one who actually turned me on to the to listen for the three different colors of light that people can have, white, mm-hmm. black, and clear, and, and the, about the different kinds of effects they have on people. And um, she describes the black light as um, uh, the voice like no other. And it, it spoke to her um, not using English, sometimes using words, but always communicating. So did you have a sense of communication from this, from this void, from this place of blackness? Not in any verbal sense or even a cognitive sense. I would say possibly in a spiritual way, I felt trans- some kind of transformation um, I don't know if that qualifies as a communication, though. No. It's very difficult to describe. <laughs> yeah, in in my world, that counts as communication. Um, <laughs> something that comes across that is beyond our ability to understand in words, and yet mm-hmm. it still changes us. Um, yeah, that's communication at a very profound level. So, yeah. Um, I've had people describe that, that black light experience as the womb of God. Exactly Um, what it feels like. And, um, so why do you feel that? Because there's so much safety. Oh, lovely. I mean, it feels like the safe is so vast that you think it would be terrifying. But yet, you feel so completely safe and secure there. You know, like, like imagine being on a little boat in the middle of the ocean and feeling completely safe. Yeah. So was there um, communication with this black space? How, how is it that you came out of, the, out of that space and back into time? I know there was somebody yelling at you. Was yeah. That- yeah. I mean, I woke up in an ambulance. They were taking me to the hospital. They told me what happened. I think the waking up process for me was kind of slow. It was kind of foggy. You know, they're, you know, running medical tests and crap like that on me and kept me in the hospital for a while. Um, but my perception now, even after that, is that. Three years later, I'm yeah. still waking up from the experience. <laughs> I love that. I'm still waking up from the experience. Yeah. Yeah. You never stop waking up from it. I guess until I die for real next time. And that's only shedding a body. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you said that you didn't want to come back. No. No, it was too nice. Yeah. It was way too nice, but I don't know. I don't know why I came back. And, and ever since then, too, you know, one of my things is trying to figure out how to have that experience without having to do any type of physical harm to myself. You know, and there's a lot of people out there that do things like ayahuasca, you know, drumming, trance, hypnotism. Uh, I mean, the only thing that works best for me right now, and I think it's the safest one for me, is, is binaural beats. Mm-hmm. Hence all the uh, albums on my top shelf. <laughs> and they are uh, albums that take you into the same places as an NDE would go. Um, but as you mentioned, thank God it's without the physical trauma. 
Yeah. You just do it in a medita- meditative state. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice to ha- nice to have a guide to help you go where yeah. you want to go. Yeah. Teach you we'll, teach you yeah. the tools for navigating in that space. Yeah, you know, one of the things I, I encourage all my listeners with my podcast, I think one of the things that makes my podcast different is that I don't tell people how things are. I don't say this is the truth about life and death and reality. Me, I'm kind of like, here's a whole bunch of things you can try and you can figure it out for yourself and have your own experience. Yep. So it's interesting. You didn't tell anybody at the hospital. I mean, you were there for three days and you no, but, but, but the people at the hospital, they're not like very attentive. I, I don't know if you've ever been in the hospital, but <laughs> I mean, other, other than dropping off some occasional food and checking your temperature and blood pressure, they don't really involve themselves too much in their patient's care, unfortunately. At least the hospital I was in, which was in Alabama at the time. They're very concerned about the, the physical need. Um, I think, you know, Kimberly Clark Sharp, who is a social worker at a large hospital, you know, she owns the story about the, the tennis shoe on the ledge. It's one of the most mm-hmm. famous NDE stories that's out there. Um, I think that's where that care comes in. It's like a, another skill set that, needs to be inserted because the nurses and the docs are, you know, having to take care of so many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's definitely a disconnect there. There's really nobody there to share with. Well, it's, it's interesting that um, you continue to tell your story, even after you were, uh, were rebuffed the first couple times out. Yeah. But, but and a lot of that has to do, though, with, with communicate, you know, talking to people like Jim Willis, PMH Atwater, um, Mary Helen Hem- Hensley. Um, Don't know her. Who else? Uh, and, and a bunch of other people that I've spoke with that, that have had near death experiences. And now I've come to understand it as. You know, it's an experience that people have. It's not unusual. It's not unusual. Well, maybe it's unusual unusual for the living, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, the latest stats, which aren't very good, they're, they date back to the 80s, um, are that, you know, 5% of the U.S. population has had a near-death experience of one flavor or another. And think how much better we have gotten at bringing people back from the dead in our emergency rooms and on our battlefields. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you know, my sense is that we're way over that 5% level, but that's the last major study that was done. Right. And out of those 5%, like how many people are actually going to tell somebody? Mm-hmm. You know. And. You know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is is the impact of stories like yours and the people that you interview on our culture at large. Mm-hmm. You know, it begins to normalize it so much so that, you know, Bart Simpson had one and Harry Potter had one. So, you know, it's if it becomes um, an accepted part of who we are as a species. Um, I think those changes might make a difference in some. I know you're making a difference. Right. It does make a difference. I also think it's a threat to certain establishments, too, like the churches and the religions, you know, because I believe, you know, my experience, too, also is like other than the three different types of experiences that you described, it's like these near-death experiences are customized to each individual and what that person is going to be able to handle and accept at that particular time. So there is no just one form of near-death experience or three forms of experience. It's very 
personal, you know, and I think it's, it's maybe it's just set up that way. The shock, so the person's not shocked, you know, whether it's being greeted by loved ones or angels, whether it's a black leg experience like mine of emptiness and, and, and serenity, you know, whether it's um, some people have described going into, you know, like the all white area and they're filled with all this healing light and then return back. I th- they're all valid experiences, and I mean, it's it's up to the individual. I mean, well, not the individual, but the universe provides that individual with that experience that's going to be most acceptable to that person's mm-hmm. consciousness or well-being. And you've heard lots of stories um, on your podcast, and assumably others people too. Um, what kind of insights have they given you as you have gone along on in pursuit of uh, podcast fame? <laughs> um, uh, you know, the message is always the same. It's, it's, it's not being afraid of dying. And if you're not afraid of dying, then you don't really have to be afraid of living. Um, however, you know, recently I, somebody was listening to one of my podcasts, and he said, well, if you're not afraid of living, if you're not afraid of dying, then why would you be afraid of, like, something like losing your job? And I'm like, well, it's different, you know? Living and dying are, you know, alpha, omega. The stuff that happens in between, like losing a job, poverty, heartbreak, those things still exist for me. Yeah, well, they're part of being in duality. I mean, we have to eat and have shelter, and hopefully there's people in our lives who love us and that we can love in return. Yeah. Those are, yeah, those are, that comes with having a physical body. Mm-hmm. So this black place, the, the, the feeling of peace that you had, um, you haven't used the word love. In, in our conversation yet. Um, right. And, and, and that? I, you know why I don't use the word love? Because love represents duality. If there's a love, then there's probably the opposite of love, whatever people want to call that. You know, I mean, some people fear, will say, mostly, say yeah. fear, some will say hate, some will say apathy. <laughs> I've, I've heard, you know, quite a few different <laughs> Theories on what the opposite of love is. This is beyond that. This is beyond the human concept of love. So that's why I don't use that. I mean, I would say the closest term available would be the Buddhist term of emptiness, which is, from my remember that that term, it's the emptiness which is full. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the closest way I could describe it. And since I kind of do lean towards Buddhist beliefs anyway, that experience would make the most sense to me. And that's why I believe they're sort of set up for the individual. So I heard via the grapevine that you're an ordained Zen priest. Is that true? I was, yes. Mm-hmm. Was, that before, both- was that before or after? Before, before I've been involved in Buddhism for a while. Um, I was, you know, I was, a, I was a lay Zen practitioner or priest. Um, actually, that organization just recently, the one I was involved with, recently just sort of shut down. They stopped operating because the guy who was running it passed away. Mm. Um, yeah, you know. I did that for a while. I will say that I would not do it again, you know, um, because belonging to a certain school of thought is limiting. Um, the only way I would go back to that is if I wanted to like, say, I spend like the last living years of my life in the monastery, trying to find, you know, whatever. Enlightened yeah. Deep in your experience or something. Yeah. yeah. So this um, near-death experience that you have, 
Um, how has that informed those other loves of your life, the, the tarot and the ancient archaeology and UFO stuff? Is it, has it flavored that at all, given oh, you right. insights as a result of it? It's all connected. I think it's all connected. Everything in this universe is connected. And um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, to me, like the, the, the tarot, you know, are, is, is a collection of symbols that shows how everything is interconnected and ever interwoven and is able to give us outside perspective on a situation or of our life, just like a near-death experience would. Mm. Well, on a smaller level. So it's like a, it's like a microcosmic near death experience. You can almost look at a tarot reading as, <laughs> Oh, you're good then. <laughs> <laughs> and for the UFOs, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people now are like into like this, uh, you know, the CE five thing where you make contact with aliens and extraterrestrials and multidimensional beings through the use of consciousness and try to communicate with them. Uh, again, you're exiting space and time to make those type of contacts to, to do that. Um, I've also, since then, I've, I've taken a course on remote viewing with, um, oh, what's his name? David Morehouse. And, oh, yeah. Um, and also, that, that was really interesting, too, because he uses the, it's, it's a binaural type of thing that you use. And um, and you're receiving information you don't know where it's coming from. So in, there's, there's to me like there's some connection between that too in the near death experience, because uh, again you're exiting space and time and pulling information. I don't know where from. You know whether it's coming from the universe, from God, from Kashic records. Um, Spirits, it, it's so strange. And then the paranormal, you know, like, like, like why, if, if, if I'm leaving my body and you're going to this black place, what is being left behind here on Earth? How is that happening? Is that some type of bilocation? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> multiple, <laughs> multiple consciousnesses. As you remember, that's what happened to me during my near-death experience, being able to, to separate and be in multiple places at once. Any last words that you would like to um, leave with us about your experience and its impact on you and the world, the community? Kind of wrap this up for us, will you? I would say that if anybody's had these experiences... You know, um, talk about them, I think. Explore them. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore it because being born into this world and dying in this world are the two biggest events of our lives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, most of us don't remember being born. And um, a few of us are lucky to die and come back and have that memory. Um, and for those people that want to have an experience, I definitely recommend experimenting with meditation. If, you know, whatever you want to experiment with, whatever is most comfortable people, whether it's meditation, um, float tanks, drugs, um, Binaural beats, trance, um, ritual magic, whatever it is, you know, I believe that this stuff is worth experimenting with to find out your own truth rather than having somebody else tell you what the truth is. I love that. That's a perfect note to end on. And so if you're interested in other lenses with which to view the universe, I highly recommend Gary's Everything Imaginable podcast. Um, it's great fun. He has some really interesting guests on it. So there, 
little commercial for you, Gary. Thanks, man. And uh, actually, today's episode was on a, a plaster cast of a Sasquatch vagina. What? <laughs> Wow, I how do you get one of those? <laughs> I, 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 li- I literally cover everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> well, thank you, Gary. And Thanks. for those of you watching this Afterlife Files podcast, stick around. I've got a couple of comments that you'll really enjoy. <laughs> thank you. It was my pleasure. Wow. Could you feel it? During this interview, I had the strongest connection with the black light than I've had in a long time. The vibration of black light just emanates from Gary's body and is caught on the recording. And there are a couple of ideas that I think could use some amplification. Just to be clear, these are my viewpoints, but that's why you watch the Afterlife Files, to gain perspective by using more than one lens with which to view this rich information. So the first idea, time dilation. If you've been watching the afterlife files for a while, you know that I believe that when we leave our physical bodies and enter into the non-physical universe, time stops and it stops being linear and all time becomes now. We've talked about how that means all of our past, present, and future lives are happening simultaneously. As a consequence, when we enter into expanded states of awareness, the veil can drop between these lives and they can begin to interact, to inform one another. Often this takes the forms of visions or sensations in a past life regression session, but sometimes Physical objects can cross over too, like the receipt for the book from Oxford. Be alert for those occurrences in your life. They may be there if you're looking for them. The second idea I'd like to explore is the distinction of emotions that relate to the physical world of duality and the emotions that are part of our home in the non-physical. Gary makes a distinction between the love we experience here, he said that is the stuff of duality, and what we experience in the non-physical world. He calls that just beyond that. It's too bad we don't have English words that capture a love that's beyond personal love. Agape just doesn't quite do it. He also asked us, you know, why are you afraid of losing your job? Because fear, the opposite of love, fear is also associated with the physical world of duality. Last idea. I'd like to echo his final sentiment. Find out your own truth rather than have someone else tell you what the truth is. I hope that podcasts such as this can give you some insight on what near-death and shared death experiencers discover about the afterlife the nature of consciousness, and how to live your life more fully. If you've not already hit that subscribe button, I would encourage you to do so. In addition, I have six albums that you can use to start the exploration on your own. If you're ready to jump all in, the best way, the best way to experience the other side is to participate in our five and a half day retreat. This retreat has two live trainers, 25 exercises into the non-physical universe and the distinct advantage of support group energy and intention. I would encourage you to go down below and look at the links associated with the NDE retreat. These links will take you to the information on the different elements of the courses and the skill set that you'll learn. This course uses binaural beat technology so that you can attain and sustain expanded states of consciousness easily and safely. That means this course is perfect for both adept meditators and newbies. All will benefit. In addition, I have my other albums and resources below. That's how we can support you with Gary's challenge to find your own truth rather than have someone else 
tell you what truth is. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, and comment. You can find the Afterlife Files on all podcast streaming apps. Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, the lot. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, or pay us a visit at neardeathmeditations.com. Neardeathmeditations.com. Bye now. See you next time. Thanks for joining us.